So now we move on to talking about experiments and sample spaces. We've already talked about set theory. And set theory is all about putting things in boxes and, and figuring out, you know, what set is, what set, how many sets or something is, and, and survey problems, sorts of things. Now we're going to move it a bit further. Uh, the things we learned in the last section regarding uh, permutations and combinations is going to become useful now because we're still going to want to count what's going on. But now we're going to want to start to frame this in terms of likelihood of stuff happening. In order to properly understand how probability works, we need to know how many things, uh, how many possibilities there are. So we come up with some language. An experiment is an activity that has an observable result. So rolling a dice, like I've got in this image here on the left, is an experiment. There's a clear, measurable result. Experiments are not things that don't have results, which is a double negative. But what I'm really trying to say here is that we're dealing with things that have clearly measurable, agreeable results. So my usual example is I could talk about rolling a die. This has a general outcome. We can all agree that the top of the die is what that die's um, outcome is, and that's very clear. On the other hand, I could talk about something like um, capitalism versus communism as an experiment, and that has a less well-defined result. There's plenty of countries around today that have been around for a while that might call themselves communists. There's plenty of countries that call themselves capitalists that aren't. So that's a little more wishy-washy, and we're going to stay out of those things. So we're looking at things that has a very much an observable result. That's an experiment for our intro to probability. A sample point is an outcome of the experiment. I roll the dice, and I get double sixes. That's a sample point. The sample space is a set of all possible sample points. So this is the sample space. We call it capital S. An event is a subset of a sample space. So here's a subset. I could get um, sixes or five and fives. That would give me a subset of this. And I talk about events being mutually exclusive if their intersection is the empty set. The intersection of the event where I get ones and where I get double sixes is mutually exclusive. There's no common ground. On the other hand, the chance that I roll at least one one combined with the chance that I roll at least one two is not mutually exclusive because I've got these overlap areas. So I've got mutually exclusive and not mutually exclusive. So that's the language that we're going to be dealing with as we work through and discuss some of this stuff. So once we have that, so I've got my experiment with my clearly observable outcomes. So let's talk about some dice problems. All right. What is my uh, event? What event has a positive die roll? Well, that's the whole sample space. Everything's positive. We don't have negative numbers on our dice. So this would equal my whole sample space S. Um, what event? Maybe event E is going to be the event where I roll my dice such that my dice roll is summed um, higher than 8. So let's look. 4 plus 4 gives me 8, so I want higher than 8, so I don't include that one. But 5 plus 4 will give me that. 6 plus 4 will give me that, so all these will give me higher than 8. 5 and 4, this. 5, 6, 7, 8, this is 8. 6, 7, 8, 9, this will give me that, so this one will give me that. Notice something about dice. Here's 8 as a sum. 5, 6, 7, 8, here's 8 as a sum. 6, 7, 8, here's 8. Dice, when they're put in this format, have this cool diagonal business. So my event E, where my sum is going to be higher than 8, 
is going to be these things. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's ten ways that I can roll dice and get them to sum higher than eight. I can talk about other events that happen. He is even. And summed. All right. So let's look at what gives me even sums. One plus one gives me two. Two plus two gives me two. Three plus one gives me two. It's an uneven number. This gives me even. This will be odd, odd, odd. This is going to be even, 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 even. These rows here will be odd. But here will be even, 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 even. And I'm going to have another thing of odds, another round of evens, another one of odds, another one of evens. Notice again, when the dice are done in this way, we get some convenient things done in the diagonal. So I can figure out when I'm even. And I can figure out when I'm going to be odd then. This one will be odd, this one will be odd, this will be odd, this will be odd, and this will be odd. So you can go through and cook up different events out of your sample space for dice. So some events work out very nicely in this sort of grid format. Other things that we might talk about that would work out decently in a grid format might be if I was talking about, um, I don't know, opinion polls. I've got different levels of wealth in voters. I can have high income, middle income, and low income voters. And my voters could be well informed, um, informed, or um, ignorant. Uninformed, uninformed, let's say like it for you. This would let me create a grid that would describe a well informed high income voter, a well informed medium income voter, and a well informed low income voter. Then I could have informed high, informed medium, informed low, and finally uninformed high, uninformed medium, uninformed low. This right here would be my sample space. It's the set of all possible outcomes of an experiment. Depending on what was happening, I might say, well, okay, so in issues regarding uh, tax increases, I would imagine that my high income voters would be well informed. Maybe my, my well informed middle class would be, you know, some more people. But tax increases generally don't affect low income people, so they might be not so well informed. I might expect more people in the, the uh, lower income levels to be here. On the other hand, if we were talking about universal health care, Suddenly, this is something that would matter to low-income people. Uh, High-income people, probably not so much, but they care. They might start shifting down here. There's a difference between, and this is why I'm talking about this particular issue, there's a difference between sample space and events versus how many people are in a particular area. When I'm talking about what is all the possible outcomes with my voters, this is the correct sample space. It doesn't understand anything about, well, certain types of people are more likely to be here or here on different issues that will affect different people and that will make them more well-informed or less informed. Instead, it just says these are all the possible outcomes and it kind of treats everyone the same. Another common example is you talk about flipping coins. And here's where we first introduce uh, the tree diagram. So I've got a coin, and I flip my coin. And it can be either heads or tails. And I could flip my coin a second time. It could be either heads again, or I could get my second flip would be tails. I could flip my coin a third time. I could either get heads again, or I could get tails for my third flip. I've already got head tails here. I could get heads for my third flip, or I could get tails for my third flip. Here I have tail head, tail head, 
Again, I could get heads for my third flip, or I could get tails for my third flip. Finally here, I've got two tails, again, heads for the first, tails for the second. This would tell you my total number. My sample space here is all of these eight possibilities that I'm dealing with. If I was looking at this in terms of uh, events, this would be my, my list of events. All heads, tails in different spots, more than one tails in different spots, all tails. We've got this option for, I don't know, my little penny. Abraham Lincoln's here. He's got his little beard and his top hat, and he's looking very stately. Yes, he's there on this one cent penny. We're flipping him, seeing what's going on. So this is just what sample space is about. We're just about working out how many options do we have and how do all those options work out. If you've got options that sort of correlate to each other, you might put them in a grid form like this. If you've got events that are sort of happening, this happens, then this happens, and this happens, something keeps on repeating itself, then you might use a tree diagram. And we talked about the dice here. I think dice and flipping coins is the one we usually talk about. I might throw some cards in eventually. Um, something else we sometimes talk about, blood types. We pick some examples that are um, usually the idea is we want it to be small enough that you could actually sort of work it out by brute force so that when we develop the methods later on in the section, we're able to get, have an instinctive feel for what our answer should be. That way then when you scale up and apply it to something that you couldn't possibly brute force because it would simply take too long, you can be a little more confident that you're getting the right answer. So let's talk about blood types. Um, blood type has this. There's going to be a space for um, the RH, and then there's a space for whether you have the A or the B antibody. Or antigens, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. So um, for this one, we either use plus or minus. And for A, if I have A, then I put A here. If I have B, I put B here. And if I've got neither, I put a zero there. But if I have B and not A, I don't write OB. I just write B. That's the notation. So under that, I could do this in a couple ways. So, so I'm trying to convince you that you know, if you're not sure whether, oh, I'm going to use a grid or I'm going to use a tree diagram, you can do it both ways. Let's look at it. If a person's here, they can either have A, they could have B, they could have both, or they could have none. And then off of each of these, they could either be positive or negative. On the other hand, I could have just as well done this with some kind of tree diagram. Excuse me, that was a tree diagram. I could just as well do this with a uh, grid of some sort, where my grid worked like this. I could have positive here and negative here. And then I could fill in my different possibilities. So here I'd have A positive, here I'd have A negative, here I'd have B positive, here I'd have B negative, A B positive, A B negative, O positive, O negative. In medicine, we're always very interested in these people because they can give blood to everybody. They have nothing that will cause people problems. This guy is also awesome because they can take anybody's blood. Full disclaimer, I am not a doctor. So you cannot take anything I say at face value. A positive, B positive, A, B positive, O positive. You start giving people blood based on what I've said here. It's your own fault when bad things happen. One of these days I'm going to get sued for the horrible things I do, but here we go. Here's our blood types. Okay. So you can figure out what sample spaces are. You can figure out what events. What are the events that I have all positives? What are the events that I have all negatives? You can figure them out in different ways.
if you like, that there's no uh, one set way of doing this. The idea is to just get a feel in your head for how many things there are. That's part of this section. The other part of this section is just using some notation. It's using notation from the set theory area. So we talk about a complementary event, the chance of E not happening. So up here, back when I talked about E is even, what is E complement? It's the odds. And we did that up here already in red, which probably you can see and I can't because I'm colorblind. But anyway, we did that with that. If I was talking about flipping coins, I could talk about H being the chance that there's um, heads in the mix. H complement then would be the chance that there's no heads. So I'd be talking about tails. The complement business you're going to have, so you're going to have a couple of questions in the section that deal with some set theory stuff, dealing with complements, dealing with intersections and unions. If you're having trouble with that, you just go back to the set theory section, get yourself brushed up on those ideas, and then come back. The main thing you want to watch out for as we move later on into Chapter 7 is this. Mutually exclusive events have an empty intersection. They have no common ground. So the chance of both of them happening doesn't work. You can't be a Democrat and a Republican in this country. It doesn't work. Those are mutually exclusive things. You sign up for one party or you sign up for the other. You certainly can't run for office on both tickets. So if you could, that seems like you'd be able to win. So you're going to want to deal with the set theory stuff. We're going to use the set theory more later on when we're trying to be clever. And the chance of something not happening is going to start to show up when we talk about some things like words. I call them weasel words. It's not quite true to call them weasel words. Wikipedia defines that differently. But it's words like at most, at least, more than, less than. Sometimes these things are hard to calculate mathematically. And then in that case, talking about the complement makes it easier.